Welcome to this week's episode of Coffee with a Journalist, brought to you by One Pitch. The guests on our show include some of the most notable journalists from the top U.S. based publications who cover topics including technology, lifestyle and culture, health, science, consumer products, and business news. We discuss their role, the types of stories they cover, what their inbox looks like, and how they connect with sources. Did you know we also have a brand new video series featuring guests from the podcast? Head to onepitch.co and look for the video page to learn more about subscribing. Today on the podcast, we're chatting with Emmy Liederman, agency's reporter for Adweek. Emmy started at Adweek as breaking news and audience engagement intern in May of 2020 before being hired full-time as an e-commerce reporter. During the episode, Emmy starts by breaking down the effects of cultural moments and pitches she receives, her personal thoughts on the best branding, what the best sources can do to reach her, and more. Let's hear more from Emmy now. Welcome, everyone. This is Coffee with the Journalist. I'm Beck Bamberger. The host you've been listening to, hopefully for a while, we've done like 80 episodes of this with our wonderful journalists. I run One Pitch, which is helping, of course, publicists figure out how to get to journalists, and then also BAM, which is an agency that works with venture-backed technology companies, just as some context. And today, ooh, someone who would actually cover BAM, well, maybe, well, pr- probably never, but anyway, my hope, Emmy Liederman, who's the agency's reporter actually at Adweek. Emmy, I love your Twitter timeline handle, which reads, Agency's reporter ad week, mildly irritating to mature audiences and deeply committed to the bit. I love it. Welcome. Thank you so much for recognizing that. I thought mildly <laughs> irritating to mature audiences was safe because it's not too self-deprecating, but it's just a little it's bit. It's just a little. A little. It's just a, <laughs> nut, a little nudge. I like it. Emily, let's start with your inbox. How crazy is it in there with pitches? Oh my gosh. Well, I'm sure everyone and their mother knows about this by now, but Facebook, I don't even know how long it went down, but all Facebook products went down this week for like a few hours. It It was mayhem. And for me, I mean, maybe I'm just being ignorant because it's not like that really affected my job too much. I mean, I don't really put my stories on Facebook or Instagram too often right now. It's a lot of Twitter. I think a lot Mm -hmm. of journalists are on Twitter, but I've been getting so many pitches about the Facebook outage and how it's affecting brands and how marketers can pivot. And I'm kind of just tired. Like I I wish that people just took a little bit of a break and like went outside, you know, <laughs> what are the pitches saying though? Like, Oh my God, no one could ship all birds this week. Like what, what's the pitch? Yeah. I don't know. I guess it's just about, social strategies. And if Facebook is down for four hours, apparently you can't sell whatever salty snacks on Facebook for four hours. And that's heartbreaking to these businesses. I don't know. It's it's just a lot. A lot of journalists were talking about this on Twitter. It's kind of like sometimes when there's a cultural moment, you have to brace yourself for the way that people will pitch to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that this is one of those moments. I don't really know how much of a cultural moment this was, but it was kind of like after the January 6th protests, getting pitches about, you know, how do corporations speak on this and what do you do next and sort of brand campaigns. It's like, you know, there's all during these social moments, Uh there are always going to be some pitches that just miss the mark a little bit. So that's one like over theme. And then another one is I just keep getting this email about Crest doing a candy campaign, which I find really what? funny because the, the toothpaste like, people, yeah, yeah, the toothpaste people are giving out a select few like safes for kids to hide their candy from their parents, which I, I get, you yeah. know, that's quirky, that's fun, whatever. But it just so goes against everything that I thought <laughs> Crest was good for. <laughs> I kind of feel like they sat around in a board meeting and was like, we have to be more relatable guys. We got to get the kids. We have to acknowledge the want candy. And I don't know, like, it's just, it's funny to me. Sometimes I feel That's like weird. brands pivot away from their own purposes because 
they want to appeal to the masses or something. So yeah, they get a bit off kilter. Now, what do you do with the pitches that land in your inbox? Do you ignore? Do you mass delete? Do you file? What you doing? Uh, it depends on my mental health. Um, <laughs> That's sometimes. an honest answer. I love that. Because most people yeah. are like, well, I do exactly this every time. And I'm like, really? Oh, I don't really have an MO. Like some people, just the way, first of all, a lot of people think my name is Emily. Mm. And I just, well, it's Emmy. yes, and it's Emmy. And it's not short for anything. It's just my parents gave me a nickname for some reason. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of frustrating when people pitch to me and follow up a bunch of times and still use me say my name or spell my name wrong because it's just annoying and sometimes people were like forward me the same pitch like without any words just like forward me the stuff from below and it's like are you just huh just a forward just a forward no note in the forward like i hope you're doing well whatever i guess they're just trying to get straight to the point wow Mm. but yeah people are rude sometimes so I try not to be rude. Like, I think that's a good that's thing generous of you. to strive for in life. I try not to be an asshole. So, you know, if there are some, I think pitches, when you can tell they're genuine and like someone put time into them and they didn't just spray and pray, I really uh-huh. try to get there. But I, I think that a lot of journalists are trying to, because it can be overwhelming to have all these pitches all the time and, and feel like you have ties to people in PR from across the industry. I think that a lot of journalists nowadays are trying to just have really close connections with like a few folks mm-hmm. and they'll go to them if they need a source or something like that. Or um, mm-hmm. So that's what I'm trying to do. I guess that's not a great answer, but just. That's it's a real answer way. though. You know what? I like that. Yeah. It's a long winded way of saying depends on how much I feel like I can look at my outlook inbox for without freaking out. Um, yep. Yep. It's really, I would say a lot of people actually share that ideology and because you don't want to miss good pitches, but. You don't, but there's, it's hard to find them when there's too many. Yeah. So Emmy, for your story inspiration, like I'm looking at your links here, you have something on Dawn, you have something on Nestle, you've got a beauty brand, you got, you know, it spans the spectrum, hot sauce. How (laughs) do you get the inspiration to do a piece? Yeah, that's a good question. I think that when I started at Adweek, the thing that I was told by my editors is every time you write a story for us and imagine a reader looking at it, they should take away something beyond just what that information of the campaign was about. They should take Mm. a marketing lesson, some sort of lesson about how to engage with a certain sector of the population, uh, advice on what not to do in their job. So sure. yep. I think that it's not worth writing stories that don't teach lessons because every publication wants to stand out to readers and be helpful and do more than just regurgitate press releases. So, and that's what I want to do as a, as a reporter. And that's what all of my colleagues are interested in doing. So I think that that's not to say that you can't have fun and, and write about silly things, but I don't know the hot, for example, the hot sauce campaign that was about trough. It's like this luxury hot sauce brand. And they did an out of home campaign in Philly. And so they just put up a bunch of billboards that were like the best cheese steak in Philly is blank and people could vote on it. And I thought that was just so clever because you know, it's not really directly branding the the hot sauce in your face, but it's getting people to think about the name and it's getting people really rowdy about something that isn't controversial, but in a way kind of is to yes, locals in Philly. Yes, oh, I'm looking at the piece now. I so love that. I just that. thought it was like simple, but fun. Oh, yeah. and then they have the vote now. Yeah, they kind of decide to make their own like, you know, best restaurant list in a city or whatever. And they're just like, oh, we'll do it with hot sauce. Yeah, and then there's an incentive because they're donating a portion or they're donating a, cer- a certain amount of money. I forget what it is to the restaurant that wins. So then the super fans oh. are interested in voting more and spreading the word. And then the um, restaurants maybe so yeah, start talking that, about it too. Cause they want to get the hot sauce. Yeah. That's yeah, a pretty yeah, brilliant so, campaign. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. It's Good a nice job. snowball. Effect. Truff. So I like that one. So, so with that yes. one particularly, how'd you know about it? 
So I had been in contact with the woman who is the marketing director, Michelle Gabe, at Trust for a little while. I know we had written about Trust because they're they're just like this brand that completely started on social media. Like they had the Instagram handle at oh, Sauce wow. before they were even a brand. I wonder how much that cost. Like they had a monopoly on, on Sauce, on condiments and Instagram, which sounds oddly <laughs> specific, but... It's important because hot sauce is like such an, for some reason, is like always intertwining with it is. It's just the Beyonce song, um, I'd say. Talk about sauce. Yes, and they've been in so many music videos, and like I talked to the dudes, and they literally sounded like they had that run it. Their names are Nick and Nick, and they sounded like they didn't have a detectable pulse. Like that's how chill they were, <laughs> um, and they just were like yeah, we're making hot sauce. You, it's really good. And like, we're just doing our oh. thing. I feel like that's just, that's just points to the best way that like the best brands, the best TikToks, the best content is just proving to people that you really don't give that much of a shit and <laughs> about yourself. <laughs> and you're just like tired. <laughs> and like, you're like, I don't care if you guys think about, I don't care if you guys like this or not. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> I don't know why it's just There's always works people that know yes it's part. something so alluring and it's also like f you I, I don't give a shit it's so wonderful it's kind of how I try to be oh it's nice Refresh me. I try to be that yeah. way too you know anxiety kind of gets yes, in the way of yes. that but I think that's the best way to reach people is create something and say, if you don't like this, I don't really care. But if you do, that's cool too. I don't care that much. And <laughs> I'm just going to do my thing. And then maybe you can like secretly care. Um, oh God. God, that is so true. Oh, Emmy, I'm really enjoying this. Today's interview will continue after this brief message brought to you by One Pitch. Are you curious to see the unique ways One Pitch helps PR professionals and marketers pitch journalists? Head to onepitch.co to learn about our new One Pitch score and see how easy it is to find the right journalist to pitch your news to. Sign up for your free account today. Now, back to today's episode. Okay, okay, we have a little fill in the blank section. My favorite sources always. My favorite sources always. Wait, can I take yes, my time yes, on this and then yes, you can cut please. it? Okay. I think. My favorite sources always explain things to me like I'm five years old. I don't think that there's any benefit in journalism of using a lot of flowery language unless unless it really helps you explain things better. I think a lot of times people get wrapped up in language and sometimes you just have to say it like it is. Maybe not five years old because I don't want people to like insult my intelligence, I guess, but... I think say things as simply as possible. I mean, I learned in journalism school that I know I'm done editing when there isn't one word that I could cut. Ooh, more. good so advice. I always thought that was, that was powerful. That powerful. And that is transferable, whether it's an Instagram post or good point. a pitch, anything. Mm-hmm. I like that. The most annoying sources always. The most annoying sources always, I would say, make sweeping generalizations without consulting enough people. Mm. I think a lot of times there's pressure Mm -hmm. to just get content out and get clicks all the time. And I think we're all guilty of that. But at a certain point, you have to realize when it's compromising your storytelling. So I think that sometimes reporters find tell the story that they want to tell and not necessarily the story Mm. that's out there so they get some sort of interview that confirms the way that they already felt about a topic and then they run Mm -hmm. with it and this is me honestly giving advice to myself because I think that I'm learning and of course you want to when you feel a certain way about something you want to find evidence for it I mean that's just human nature bias Mm mm-hmm confirmation bias of course but I think that that's being at least acknowledging that and understanding that it's a thing is I think what the best sources do Mm -hmm. you'll never get a response from me 
if. You'll never get a response from me if you forward me. <laughs> I mentioned it before, but if you forward me your original pitch and say no words. What is because that? To me, that's the equivalent. Of, that's the equivalent of like trying to talk to me and then like coming up to me and poking me and like not saying anything. It's that's like just, the ultimate laziness, too. Yeah, it just feels so rude. Like I don't generally care about people respecting me or whatever I don't think that I'm like deserving of respect I'm like 21 years old and never get out of my pajamas but I just feel like that is something that like is so disrespectful and it doesn't take a lot again like for me to I don't take myself that seriously to like feel like oh you're disrespecting me whatever but yeah that can we can we go back for a second are you in your pajamas right now so I actually happened to, I put on this shirt that I got from nice. Forever 21. I think you might have Yes, on our it. little recording. Yes. I'm wearing, like, I'm wearing like boxers that I don't, I really don't know where they came from. <laughs> they could be my, bo- my brothers. They could be my ex friends. Like I really. Okay. And second you. question. Second um, question. Are you 20? Are you 21? Yes. Oh my God. That is amazing. So you literally can go to Forever 21 because you are. 21 oh i didn't think about that yeah forever 21's making a comeback it is they they're trying real hard i mean not that i would know i'm an elder millennial i don't dare step in there but i've so heard i've so heard (laughs) that that's the case no but they also they're really scary because there's that old joke when you like you'll see something at forever 21 that you think is cute and then it says in huge letters like god is good oh, and you're like gosh. i don't know if that's yeah. like that's just yeah. not for yeah me. yeah <laughs> oh, they ruin it. but yeah i am 21 awesome i and look at you with the journalism job all star thank you i you know try to stay humble but i do but not think give a shit. that's that the key I'm, yeah <laughs> maybe like not give a shit as your brand, outward brands but then you know freak yeah entirely out when no one's around well the next fill in the yes. blank the best compliment I received about my work was? I think I wrote a story about Grace Wells, who is a TikTok creator. And she made this whole series when she really wanted to get into production and, and she was a, into film. And, and she made this whole series about making random objects interesting. So she made a commercial for like a fork and hmm. random things that, would never like have a commercial and was able to make them enticing. Mm-hmm. So I wrote this story about how she was getting signed and had all of this paid work after she did a series. And I just got so much nice feedback from that, from her just saying that she really appreciated me telling that story. But oh, that's a lot nice. of people seem to respond well and just said, you know, this is a story that marketers need to read to understand how to recruit the right talent in mm-hmm. this day and age. And go on channels that aren't traditionally Mm -hmm. looked at like you know who would ever think that you could find your next video producer on tiktok but if the talent is there then why why not not, you know so and those people that really do understand how to reach an audience on social so i think that was cool to be able to tell a story about someone that was a little bit untraditional in paving their way into the industry but reflected a lot of the trends that are going on today hmm, that's nice i love when someone would reach out and say like you know just thanks for doing that that's kind of nice okay yeah my yes. perfect sunday is my perfect sunday okay i think that i would go to the beach really early read on the beach and then like fall asleep on the beach Ooh. make sure that i drown myself absolutely in sunscreen absolutely first. good wake up on the beach get like a whole sushi platter and wine to eat on the beach. (laughs) Then I would just like stroll around and window shop, I think. I don't know exactly where this place is. Okay, okay, it's totally fine. Totally fine. Yeah, and then there's something about like taking a shower after you go to the beach and then going out to dinner and like dressing, putting on your little like jeans and a nice top and having your hair a little bit wet and you feel maybe you're like have a little bit of a suntan and you just, just feel that exhaustion from your yes. feet, but you're relaxing over like your front genuine suit mm-hmm. like that's <laughs> such a beautiful day to me and that's probably not an average sunday at all 
I mean, I've never experienced a day quite uh, like that. that. Quite dreamy. But, I love it. Yeah, just a lot, of, a lot of reading and sleeping, and maybe some meditation. Yes, and just a little bit of exercise. A little just, exercise, you, you can know, get so exhausted. I like it. That's a good but, one. Yeah, I like it. Okay, my favorite hobby is my favorite hobby. I love to collect magazines and make them into collages. Mm. And they're always, I wish that I had an example to show you, but um, it's always just like very random words and there's really no words and pictures mm. and they're mood words. And I feel like there's really no way of explaining them, but they just make sense to me. I love it. And it's something that takes a lot of time, but is sort of mindless, but in a way still creative. Yes. So it's a great way for me to just relax and actually read magazines, but tear them apart as I'm reading them. Yeah, and make them, make them into something. something. Oh, I like that. Okay. The last song I listened to was. Oh my gosh. The last song I listened to, I have to check my Spotify. Ooh, I've really been into spa music 2021. Really? It's a playlist on Spotify. I love listening to it in the background of writing because I can't my brain doesn't work in the way that I can just like listen to a song with talking with singing and write at the same time so I've been listening to like a lot of great spa music spa and music. meditation wow. yeah just meditation music and wow. yeah okay what else can I, I like it but how about my best Halloween costume was? Oh my gosh. That's the perfect question for me because my mom happens to be incredibly artistic and like she was just never okay with not giving us an out of this world creative Halloween wow, costume. Wow, really? So one day I was, yes, it was like one of the best parts of my childhood. So because she would just get so excited about this and it would be something that she would start creating like a month or so or even more in advance. So, you know, one year I was an Emmy Award oh. and I had the wings <laughs> and the ball and I like posed and I had glitter all over my body and it took like weeks for me to get the glitter out of my contacts, which was oh, incredibly yeah. painful. Glitter. Very bad. <laughs> but it was so fun. And then another year I was a doll in the box. So she made me a box and then dressed me up and then on the side, it was just so realistic. Like on the side, you had Mattel and the TM oh, wow. and a barcode. This is elaborate. Um, and then, yes. And then it was like, collect all these styles for your doll. And it was pictures of me in different outfits. It was oh really clever. Oh my clever. gosh. Wow. Maybe you could so, send us one of those photos so we could admire this. I love asking that question because we're hearing all types of amazing things here. That's a, that's a great question. How did you think? Of well, that? we have this for our little like seasonal for like October people. We get to ask that oh. because also the last thing, last one here, my favorite part of fall is. I think my favorite part of fall is transitioning away from the sweatiness and yes. the clothes yeah. that are tied to summer, mm -hmm. you know, like the shorts and, and the dresses that you chafe under mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the sandals. There's something, and this is probably a very common answer, but it makes sense because sweaters are amazing. They I mean, are. There's something really great about just lounging in a sweater. And I think that fashion, it's a lot easier to be trendy when you feel like you're not sweating <laughs> to the point of exhaustion. <laughs> like there are a lot more options yeah. and you just feel together. Yes. Nothing. And it's less about, you know, the way your body looks. Yes. <laughs> And more about you know, being fashionable and having this self-expression. So I think yeah. that that's kind of liberating as fall yeah, comes. Yeah, I agree with that. Nothing dampens your attitude than buckets of sweat, mm -hmm. literally and figuratively. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, what are you reading, watching, listening to? You know, we'll take anything because we like to consume all the stories. So right now I am reading... The Hilarious World of Depression by John Moe. It's a book what? and it's also a podcast. Wait, I got to look this up on Audible. Yes. And it's basically, I mean, part of the premise is the fact that a lot of comedians suffer from depression and they use comedy as an outlet and it ends up 
it's really just this common theme and it helps them shape their material. And a lot of it is just about this guy and his experience with depression. And he just speaks so candidly about it. And I have the book in front of me right now. There's a quote that says, this book is an excellent life raft for those of us who are so sure that we are alone in our struggles. Mm. Um, As someone who has both depression and anxiety, I think a lot of times when I'm struggling, I just assume that no one could ever understand. And even if it does feel that way and it's hard to kick that feeling, it's amazing to just have this book in front of me and hear other people's stories and just say like, I can really relate to that. I mean, that's something that I've experienced and to be able to laugh about it. Like sometimes your thought process when you're depressed is funny because it's just so irrational. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not funny in the moment. Like in the moment, it's the fucking worst. Yeah, yeah. But when you have a little bit of space from it, you're like, did I really think that way about myself? Or did I really think that that was a good use of my money or time? And not to trivialize it, but that's just my experience with it. I, I mm-hmm. noticed that when I have a little bit of space from it, I can laugh. And I think that, I mean, I said in my Twitter bio, I'm like deeply committed to the bit. I don't know like how much we have if we're not able to laugh, you know, like it's that's true. Just the ultimate, it's true. That's the ultimate test of mindfulness, the ultimate test of being able to be present and enjoy the moment. And I just love that that book encapsulates mm, that. I love that. I just downloaded it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, perfect. He has, um, I get all my inspirations from this exact podcast. This is everything that consumes my cultural input. Absolutely. I love it. Well, Emmy, let's, oh, were you going to ask anything else? Oh, I was just going to say if, so had you heard of the podcast or no? No, not the podcast. No, and not, nor that book. Yeah. So it's the hilarious world of depression. And then he has another one that he just started up called depression mode. And it's, it's the depression same format. Mode. I love it. Yeah, just having people on talking about their depression. And he calls people with depression saddies. And it just like makes it into this fun thing. Never, in a way, it's not depressing. It's actually really liberating to feel like other people are going through the same stuff. So, Mm -hmm. yes, I I recommend it. Mm, Good one. Emmy, we are going to now play the Mad Libs part. So this is like the first word that you think of and I'm going to fill it in. So I'm going to tee you up with the word, whatever word you think of right away, boom, we fill it in and then I'll read you back the whole statement and we'll see if it's, you know, weird, funny, very on point. You know, there's a whole range of how these can go. So are you ready? Yes. Is all ever Okay. Today. Okay. Here you go. First one. What's an emotion? Sadness. Speaking of, yep. Yeah. An adjective. Meaty. Meaty. Another <laughs> adjective. Sparkly. Sparkly. A greeting. Mazel tov. Does that count? Mazel tov. Yes. I like it. <laughs> A verb. Why is it that every word in the English language escapes me when you ask this. Yeah, right. Um, Everyone struggles with this. It's funny. Jump. Jump. A noun. Pickle. Pickle. Another adjective. Fluorescent. Oh, good one. A cringe-worthy PR term or phrase. Oh, God. e Oh, gosh, that is bad. Yes. Okay, a part of a pitch. Part of a pitch. Like? Like subject line or lookbook or media kit. Yeah. Media kit. I like that one. All right, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Okay. Great. We're almost done. Length of time. Three hours. Three hours. Name of a real person. Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd. Mm Mm-hmm. And then an emotion. Fearful. Fearful. Okay. Are you ready, Emmy? Here we go. When I think of the future of journalism, I feel sadness. The pitches I receive have gone from meaty to sparkling. If I receive a pitch that starts with mazel tov, I jump. 
When I write stories on pickles, I get fluorescent. But my favorite pitches include e-meat and media kit. I normally take around three hours to respond to my emails, but if it's Paul Rudd, I will respond immediately. If you get a response back from me, you should know I'm very fearful for you. Wow. Why do I feel like the fearful one checks out? There you go. <laughs> Sometimes quite illuminating, right? Yes. yes. I think that changed my life. Thank you there so you much. There you go. Emmy, thank you so much for being on our little por- dorky podcast, little coffee, little journalism, all the good stuff. And I can't wait to read that book, actually. I really appreciate that. Yes, of course. Well, I appreciate you thinking of me and reaching out to me. I am happy, so happy to be in this industry and to work among so many people that I admire. And it was just great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Coffee with a Journalist featuring Emmy Lederman from Adweek. If you enjoy listening to our show, make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And if you have a moment, please leave us a review to share your thoughts about the show and today's guest. To learn more about the latest tools on OnePitch and to subscribe to our weekly podcast newsletter, head to our website at onepitch.co. We'll see you all next week with a brand new guest and even more insights about the journalists you want to learn more about. Until then, start great stories.